And I'd now like to introduce you to our first speaker, um, IHH's own Dr. David Schoenaker. Uh, David is the clinical site lead in Novato and leads our chiropractic service line. He's an expert chiropractor and integrative medicine practitioner, having practiced integrative chiropractic care for over 30 years. David has either founded or co-developed several integrative medicine clinics in his career and joined the IHH in 2013. As a clinician, David approaches each patient's health through a broad and holistic lens. In addition to chiropractic adjustments and body work, David provides healthy lifestyle counseling, meditation tools, qigong practices, along with presence and a deep listening to evoke a, a healing response for his patients. When not with patients, you can find David on a paddleboard or his motorcycle or behind a camera, or playing music, or with his family. David is one of those rare beings in the world who is not only an extraordinary, extraordinary healer, but also a renaissance thinker, a wise and devoted friend. I've been grateful to have him as a colleague. Um, I'm going to have a talk tonight that's going to be like the meat and potatoes part of what to do tomorrow, and how to think about um, your health, and how to think about having the best chance of not having significant degenerative changes like obesity and diabetes and cardiovascular issues and cancer, okay? But before I do that, since we're going to talk a lot about exercise and sleep and a little bit about nutrition, and um, about connecting both to each other and to nature. I had, I had an experience. I don't like this microphone stuck in here because I want to move around. Um, I had this experience with my son. I have an uh, adult son who has some special needs and takes some medicine. And a particular medicine he takes makes his sugar metabolism kind of wonky. So he has a hard time not being heavy. And with the, you know, the Genius Bar at Apple, if you've ever been to, had any issues with Apple, and you go to the Genius Bar, and they fix your phone, or fix the battery, do whatever. And he's looking around the room, and he says the darndest things sometimes, and he goes, you know, they're coming out. I'm not always the heavy guy in the room anymore. It feels good. And I just kind of thought, I'm just about to go give a talk about preventing obesity and all that stuff. And Chris is going to tell you that probably every other person or every third person in the country has obesity issues. And it just made me kind of step back and say, you know, it's about connecting. No matter what you look like or what you're into, if we lose sight of that, it's kind of like we spend all our time working on the car and we forget about the drivers. It's driving this thing. So it just took me back. So I thought I'd do that now because it'd be kind of a buzzkill if I did it later. Anyway. <laughs> so anyway, um, let's see if this will work. No. Yes. So I thought this image was kind of cool because you think of, well, my, my dad had, um, you know, obesity and hypertension and my mom had breast cancer and, um, problem or something that I'm doomed. I'm going to have exactly what they have, except I'm going to get both of them. And I just thought it was kind of a cool picture. And what we're going to talk about is that's not necessarily the case. So, here. Can we have a little bit of, here we go. So, what we're going to do is talk about, like, what we know. So, we have a sense of our, a limited sense of our genetics, of our family and our lineage, what our parents had, what our grandparents had, what our brothers and sisters had. We know about our lifestyle. We know about the lifestyle that we were raised in. We know about the mindset of our family, the mindset that we have if we're so fairly self-reflective. We kind of know about the environment we were raised in, where we were raised next to an agricultural facility or uh, out in the country where it was really pristine or an inner city, and we know that. And we might even know some what are called multi-generational epigenetic factors, like, you know, was mom in a car accident when I was in utero, or was, you know, grandpa in a war and had PTSD and then dad had PTSD and it kind of gets passed along. 
So those are the kind of things we know about a little bit. All right, here we go. And then we have the mystery things, like, you know, genetic mutations, um, what, how our body is responding to the pace of life now, all the EMFs everywhere, the screen time, the constant neural stimulation that we're getting, like, I mean, how many times a day do you check the news? Great. Let me make up for me. Um, I look at it like this. I check the news when I don't care if I feel like I'm getting punched in the stomach, and if I don't care that, then I check the news, and if I don't. Um, pollu air pollution, that's an interesting thing in this area. When you think about it, our bodies have adapted over you know, thousands and thousands of years, and having some forest fire smoke is probably not a big deal, right? But having smoke from Kmart burning up is like, what does our body do with that? You know? So those are kind of unknown things that are going on. And so the point is, whether it's known or unknown, you're going to do the same thing. You're going to turn the slide. You're going to take the knowns and the unknowns here. And I wanted to coin a little thing, so I called it the life expression energy converter. And you're going to put it through that life expression energy converter, and you're going to come out the other side as optimal expression of your life, an optimal expression of your genetic potential. Because your genes are kind of there. What you do with them is up to you in many respects. It's not always the case, but for the purposes of tonight, it is. So awareness of what you got going on, which you just talked about that, making a choice, and then some action. So that's like the key to the whole way of making change. And if you look down this thing, we're going to talk about exercise, nutrition, sleep, and relationships, or social interactions, or connection. And the other ones are aspects of, let's say, um, the IHH, where we have functional medicine, psychotherapeutics, chiropractic, acupuncture, body work, prescription medicine, everything to kind of help bump you through. What I'm going to talk about tonight mostly is what you can do to bump you through, and then you grab onto your team of whatever you need to take you to the next place or to get help getting to this place. So <clears throat> you see here, keep going. I have to go fast because... I love this slide. So exercise positively affects 7,660 genes, which is of the total like 20,000 protein transcripting genes we have to work with. So that's kind of cool, over a third. Working out is a huge, huge thing. The biggest deal with working out is what's your motivation to work out? You know? You're running around the track saying, my doctor said I got to run or I'm going to have a heart attack, damn it. That's not very sustainable. Um, if you're kind of a loner type and you just want to go to the gym and lift weights and get in your own headset, listen to some music and think about your day, that's great. If you're a social person, you like to go to yoga classes or tai chi classes or you like to in a running group, that's great. But what if you don't? Fully a third of my patients don't. They don't want to have a bedtime. They don't want to exercise. So there's two big metrics right there that are hard to work with. So what do you do? Find a motivation. Do you have a bucket list? you want to take your grandchild to the Great Wall of China when you're older? Do you have grandkids? Do you have kids that you want to hang out with? Do you have um, something you want to learn that it would be way better if you were healthy and fit to learn those things or whatnot? So it's kind of like look inside and see what is... What's my motivation to move something forward? And this one here is um, Michael and Stephen and Judith. And that's... Oh, we'll get him back. And that's a little bit of Sadie right there. And those are big motivations in my life because those guys are intense and I like to keep up with them. Okay. So... Off we go. Next one. Anybody recognize that guy? Yeah. Jack LaLanne and his wife right there in his late 70s. I like that too. So this is a kind of thing he said. Exercise is king and nutrition is queen. Together you have a kingdom. And I love that because 
when you exercise, you activate those 7,600 genes and you stimulate the detoxification of your cells and you, stim you enliven your entire system, all your endocrine system, your nervous system. And then if you put the food in and it's good food, then it builds. And he, that was his main thing. It's like those two things will carry you a long ways. And obviously he was still doing his two-hour-a-day workouts when he was 96, up until two weeks before he died. So long, healthy life, and then die. I like that. I'm not going to talk much about posture other than if you look at those things right there, super important. The only postural correction I give people, almost the only one, is lead with your heart through life, not your forehead. And when you embody that, I mean somatically embody leading with your heart, it's a whole different thing. It just kind of lines everything up in the right spot. Because if you're trying to hold your shoulders back, relax or pull your chin and do all this stuff, you just get exhausted and you give up after a while. So that's my postural talk for the night. And of course, workplace ergonomics, everybody's all over that same thing. I saw this one recent chiropractic thing where they did this great paper, and it was in um, 10 minutes. It was in the, um, uh, which one was that? Journal of uh, Chiropractic and Manipulative Therapies. And they found that changing the forward head, tread, head translation angle back six degrees increased electrical conduction through the brain stem. And I thought, wow, by about 12%. So it was a pretty cool study. I think it's a real thing to try and stand up straight. So this little guy right here is what I have in the classroom, or in the, <laughs> in the clinic. 28 bucks on Amazon. And it's an entry place for a lot of people who don't like to exercise. Balance. So here's a classic little morning. Get up, get out of bed, make your coffee or your tea, and make a nice nutrient drink smoothie or something. Okay? And... Uh, Get on your balance board, get stable, do 10 squats, get off, get on your balance board, do 10 squats, do that three times. And then the doorbell rings and it's your neighbor that you like to go on a brisk walk around the neighborhood for 30 minutes. Okay, so there you got your day. You got exercise, you got nutrition, you've got connection. And if you do those three right, it's going to help your sleep. So it's like, this is the kind of stuff I'm talking about how to change your habits so that you ground those principles every day to let things move through. All shot around San Francisco, stand-up balance, yoga balance, classroom balance, stimulates, stimulates brain-drive neurotrophic factors in your brain, stimulates brain growth. Um, we, I'm not going to go there. And um, it's so available. And especially for people who don't want to exercise unless they have people to exercise with. And doing it outside is a whole other thing. We're going to talk about that in a second. Um, something that's in the literature a lot right now is strength training. It's all over the place. And some of it's from the CrossFit movement. And they've got a lot of really great exercise physiologists that are involved in their organization. If you ever go to their websites and you look a little deep to the research, it's fantastic. And balance training helps your brain, relaxes you. It's good for anxiety, reduces depression. But here's a study. People in the 70s and 80s who are already having cognitive impairment, radical change, especially when they add some weights. So now you have your morning routine. It's a little bit better. You've got the tea and the nutrient drink and your balance work. Then you've got your 10-pound dumbbells and you do your, your things. And then you're... And then you go for your walk. So now you've got the day is really cooking, right? You got that thing going on. So that's something to think about. That's what food looks like. For reals, that's what food looks like. I'm not going to talk about nutrition too much. I'm just going to say, read that book. That book was written um, between 1920 and 1929 and 1930 by Weston Price. 
amazing book. It really gives you um, sibling and twin studies of families where you had one up in the mountains and one moved to the port of commerce, one starts eating the food of commerce, and one starts, keeps eating the indigenous diet. And they follow them, and then they follow their offsprings. And it is mind-bending. And it's kind of the root of a lot of this functional medicine wave that we're all enjoying right now. So get that book, and then read Chris's books, and go to his website, and things like that, because he's giving you the science and everything current for something that started a long time ago. And um, get really cool um, this stuff right here. I'm serious. When you go out, and when you go in the kitchen, and you pick up a knife that feels just right, and you have pots and pans that you love to look at and touch, it's kind of like a mechanic having all beat up tools. You know, really cool mechanics, good mechanics don't do that. They have really have snap on. They have tools that feel good in your hands. It changes your whole thing in the kitchen. It makes it so much more fun. Okay. So sleep, big thing. Thing on this chart right here is that one. That's a scary one for me right there. Because when you start doing your homework at 7.30 or 8, and you're texting five people, guess what time you go to bed before you get your homework done? Midnight. And then you got to get them to go to school in the morning. And it's a big problem. And it creates a lot of issues for kids. So I really counsel my patients, like at, say goodnight to your friends after dinner and then do your homework and get to sleep and then say hello to your friends in the morning. Just like try and have some kind of discipline, you know? I got a lot of patients that are on the rowing teams and things like that. And the coaches just say this, it's a rampant problem. They have to deal with it constantly with the teenagers. It's like you, you can't do that. You have to sleep or you will not be able to perform. Okay. Get this book. This guy right here is in Berkeley. He's, this will just blow your mind. This book will blow your mind. And do, what was the other slide we had there? Do that. For real. Everybody needs a bedtime because you are a biological clock. And the way a lot of my patients live, it's like they're always changing time zones every day. They're always out of sync with themselves and with their physiology. So, anyway, I forgot to tell you that. Um, read that book, learn about it, get inspired to make a good choice. If you still have a hard time going to sleep, check into the binaural beats, hemi-sync technology. A lot of you have been exposed to it. It's basically a different frequency that goes in each ear and kind of drives your brainwave pattern or encourages your brainwave pattern to go into a sleep state. And they're all over the place on the internet and everything. The main thing is that you like the sound of it. Like, I can handle bamboo flutes for about four minutes. <laughs> and then forget about it. I can handle waves for a little while, and then it's like, mm. But if, I, so I have to get the right thing to make me feel relaxed by, you know, sonically. And then, because you're not going to hear the phase of the beats. Those are just happening. So anyway... So get those, and read that, and then uh, do this. Okay, so here we go. We're going to do our first practice really fast. So I want you to just put your hands out like that. I want you to shake your right hand. And then I want you to shake your left hand. Now look at your right hand. And let the feeling come into your right hand. And then look at your left hand and put all your attention in your left hand. And right, go back to the right hand. And left. Now don't look, just do it with your mind. Back and forth, like a ping pong ball. Back and forth, okay? So this is a tool called somatic anchoring. I don't even know if it's called somatic anchoring, I just call it somatic anchoring. But it's something that you can do with your brain, your monkey mind brain, when you're trying to lie in bed. And so this is the sequence. You bring your attention to your navel, then your left hand, 
left foot, bottom of your left foot, bottom of your right foot, palm of your right hand, back to your navel. And you leave your mind at your navel until you start thinking again. And then left hand, left foot, right foot, right hand, back to the navel. Thinking again, left hand, left foot. And you just use it as a trigger. If you're a side sleeper, you can do navel, bottoms of both feet, up and down. So when I ask my patients for the most part, like, well, how did it go last night with the somatic anchoring? Well, I don't know. I fell asleep. <laughs> I always say that. So, and a lot of people have this issue right here. If you're lying on a pillow and you have to remember something for tomorrow, forget it. Write it down. Go back to the pillow. Do it as many times as you can until you don't have to think about anything for tomorrow because that's a, that's a real sleep wrecker. Okay, so <clears throat> huge, hanging out with people. Just read that a little bit. Just hanging out with people decreases your inflammation. So what do we have? We have, I don't know what I'm thinking of right now, but I'm sure I'm pointing up there. There's a lot of movies where people did that. Um, exercise. Nutrition, sleep, connection to decrease inflammation, balance the nervous system, increase well-being, which decreases degenerative disease and increases your life experience. That's what this whole thing is. It's just the same thing over and over. Same thing this does. Okay, get that book. Read that book. Is it, it's just crazy when you read it. It's just the neurophysiology of nature, quieting down your mind, synchronizing your hemispheres, changing your blood pressure. It's amazing. And then, do you have anything else? Oh, we do have another slide. Yeah, do this a lot. So let's say you do this one over here. And you pack a lunch, a good lunch from that, li that list of foods that I showed you. So then you've got exercise, nutrition, connection, and you're out in nature, so your brain waves are going to chill out and you're going to feel relaxed, so you're going to sleep better. So then you've got all four with that one. Okay? So now the next thing we're going to do is we're going to have a little practice together. It's going to be a nature immersion practice. It's from photography that I do. It's um, me wandering around with a camera, natural light, handheld, no Photoshop, no filters, nothing. Just getting into a soft space in myself, an imaginative space. And um, I'm going to share a little, little move, slideshow movie with you. It'll go on for like three minutes. And my encouragement is that you just kind of let yourself go into it and don't think about it. It's going to feel like there's a lot of soft, watercolory, blurry areas, and then there's some focused areas where I'm bringing my attention to, which will bring your attention to those places. And just let yourself go with it and see what happens. And then um, we'll, have, we'll just sit here for a minute or two and before he brings the lights up, and that's it. And then we can talk about things later in the Q&A, okay? Here we go.
coming. You've been a great audience. I've had fun doing this. I wanted to share this talk for a long time. So I hope you got something out of it.